This is Join Us in France, episode 57. Hello, I'm Annie, and on today's show, we go to the beautiful region of Burgundy with tour guide Kelly Camborian. Kelly is an American who moved to Belgium and later to France for love. And Kelly is a history buff, and she certainly knows her stuff really, really well. We didn't get to talk about all of the things she had prepared, so much to talk about there. We mostly talked about the rich history of the area and Burgundy wine, but she also had some great recommendations for hotels, restaurants, things to do with kids, uh, things to do when it's raining. You know, we didn't get to all of that. So I'll put all of that in the show notes at joinusinfrance.com forward slash 57. Make sure you check those out. She really gave out a lot of very interesting information. Now, Burgundy is a rock star when it comes to wine lovers, and I'm really surprised that more tourists, general tourists, don't go. So much of French history took place right there. It's really a must-go for Francophiles. And we didn't get to talk about Dijon very much, even though I intended to. I guess I'll have to ask her back on the podcast so she can tell us more about it. So please give a warm welcome to Kelly by going to joinusinfrance.com forward slash 57 and telling her how much you enjoyed her episode. If you'd like to book a tour with Kelly, find her on Facebook. You spell her name K-E-L-L-Y, K-A-M-B-O-R-I-A-N. Or on Twitter, she's at, um, at Camborian. Or you can email her, it's kellycamborian at gmail.com. No spaces or dashes or anything like that. Okay, here's Kelly. Well, hello, Kelly. How wonderful to talk to you. How are you? Fine, thank you. Hello to you too. Thank you. Uh, from from uh, cloudy Burgundy. Oh, yes, it's cloudy <laughs> in Toulouse too. It's, it's yes. terrible, but it's the winter. What are you going to do? That's right. It's winter. <laughs> well, to begin with, can you tell us a little bit, a little bit about yourself? Maybe where you're from, all that. Yes. Well, once again, my name is Kelly Camborian. I live in fontaine les dijon uh, presently, um, but I was born and brought up in New England, around Boston, in Massachusetts, and in New Hampshire. Mm-hmm. And I've been in Europe for over twenty years. Oh wow! Particularly, yes. So in France, about twenty and I lived in Belgium for a while too. So I've been here a long time. Um, I have a master's degree in archaeology. Uh-huh. And um, currently, presently, I work as an English teacher in uh, continuing education and as a um, an accredited national French tour guide. Wonderful. And you told us the name of the city. Do you want to tell us a little bit where it is in France? Because I, I bet people haven't heard of it. In fontaine les dijon yes. fontaine les dijon is just outside of Dijon. Um, dijon being in the sort of center toward the east. Um, yeah. And fontaine les dijon is known because, uh, well, it's not very well known. But if anybody <laughs> knows fontaine les dijon it's because the great Saint Bernard was born here. Not the dog, <laughs> the saint. The saint. And so... Yeah, the saint. And he is known for being the reformer of the Cistercian order, which we will talk about. He was a great personality in Europe in the 12th century. Wonderful. Wonderful. Mm -hmm. Okay. So you say you've been working as a tour guide for many years then? For many years, yes. That's great. So you have a lot of experience. That's wonderful. Mm -hmm. What what would you say is your, like the philosophy behind your, your services? What do you, how do you see yourself? Uh, I adapt my visit to my audience. Uh-huh. Um, I Obviously, the information stays the same, but it's the way I present the in- information to the audience that I have. Meaning, if I have um, children in the audience, I try to engage them as much as I can, because sometimes history, uh, straight history doesn't uh, please sure. them. If I have um, people who are very well read, so I can push the historic and um, architectural explanations a little further. Uh, So I really, and even even nationalities. So I know that the English know a little bit more about, for example, the hierarchy of royalty. True, uh, true. uh, What's a a count? Whereas the Americans, the Australians don't, which is completely normal, because it's just not part of their culture, their history. So I would say that is my strong point in my guiding. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. 
Well, adaptability is really important, especially to mm -hmm. children, because, you know, right. I mean, you want to keep them happy. Yes, that's <laughs> right. And interest them. And there is there are ways to interest them, even if it's history and art history. You just have to find the right formula. Yeah, yeah. Okay. All right. So what's special about Burgundy? The, introduce the area, because yeah. you're the first person to tell us about this area. So, you know. Oh, well, I'm honored. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, <laughs> and it's one that's fabulous. I mean, to, to put it on the map a little bit, if you draw a line between Paris and uh, the south of Germany, uh, Dijon would be in the middle, right? That's right. Okay, that's right. It's really between also Paris and Lyon if you need to put it on the map, because the northernmost city in Burgundy, Sens, is one hour from Paris, on a, sort of on a, almost on a straight line. Right. And the southernmost city, Macon, is an hour north of Lyon, also okay. almost on a straight line. Uh, so we're really between, and then we go to the east, as you said, toward the Jura, toward the Franche-Comté in Germany. Yes, mm -hmm. and, and um, today is, as we're recording, it's, to, it's uh, February 26th, and mm -hmm. it's the birthday of Victor Hugo, who was born mm -hmm. near where you are. He was born in Besançon. That's 213 right. 213 years ago. Mm -hmm. <laughs> One of my favorite French authors. So okay, I, I so, thought I'd mention yes. him. <laughs> good. That's good. Everything's good. Huh? <laughs> so tell us about Burgundy in general. Well, Burgundy, um, I like to begin by saying Burgundy is one of the 22 regions in uh, what we call metropolitan France. So people understand that there are people who are not French, um, that uh, France is divided into regions, uh, which were created after the revolution, after the fall of the king, to administer the country. Yeah. And it was pretty much formed on the former Duchy of Burgundy, which we'll talk about a little bit more, uh, with a few added um, extras. It is really an agricultural region. We've already said where it is. It's very highly agricultural and it is divided into four departments. So we understand that too. Uh, we have the department of the Yon in the north, named for the river, the Yon River, which runs through it. That's with a Y. Uh, with a Y. Y-O-N-N-E. -N -N -E. yep. The Yon. Now, just a word about that, because we probably won't talk about this later. In fact, it's the Seine that flows into the Yon, and it should be the Yon that fl that is in through flows through Paris and not the Seine. Oh. But that's just a, right, a Burgundian huh, <laughs> aspect. No, but it's true. It's true. It's actually the Seine that flows into the Yon. But it was already a mistake that the Romans made back in antiquity. So. Oh, well, it's an old mistake. You can't fix it now. I'm sorry. So, exactly. <laughs> and, and think of how many songs we'd have to change. I know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no. <laughs> so we have the Yon in the yep. north. Um, and then we have the Nièvre, uh, which is slightly to the west. Um, and then it's named for the major city, Nevers, which was a very important city uh, of counts in the Middle Ages. Mm -hmm. And then we have the Côte d'Or, which is where I am. Côte d'Or meaning um, golden slopes or golden hillsides, mm -hmm. um, because the Côte are where the grapes grow. And one of the theories behind why it's called the golden slopes is that in the autumn, all the leaves of the um, vines turn a bright yellow gold, and so it looks like golden slopes or golden hillsides. It's a beautiful name. <laughs> and it's a beautiful name, that's right. <laughs> and then we have the Saône et Loire, uh, so toward the south, because the Saône River and the Loire River run through it. Aha, very good. Mm -hmm. Very good. And these are... Very agriculture. I mean, very agriculture. Yeah, that's the, right. The, the most populated most, place is Dijon, I suppose. Dijon, that's right. Dijon is the capital of Burgundy, and it's the most populated. It has a population in Dijon proper of about 150,000 people, in Greater Dijon about 300,000. Yeah, it's the 18th largest city in France. Okay, okay. And is there a big, um, uh, like a major employer, a major industry in the area, or is it all small businesses? It's smaller business. We, we don't have one major industry in near, around Montbar, so in the Côte d'Or in the north. We have what we call Metal Valley, mm. where a lot of the big metal companies are, the Valorec Group, ArcelorMittal, um, some other German uh, metal groups. And that, too, is a long-standing history of... Um, mining the ore and metal working from already from antiquity from the Gauls. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So um, we have that in that area. And then in the Creusot too, it's industrial. Again, we have metal working. Uh, we have some um, 
nuclear energy. Mm-hmm. And so it's sort of uh, around certain poles mm-hmm. of uh, source centers. So it's a that's little right. bit of everything. A little bit of everything. Yeah. That's yeah. right. Mm-hmm. Very good. So what's the, what's it like? What sets it apart from the rest of France uh, as far as the culture and the atmosphere, that sort of thing? Um, well, it is it is very agriculture. So when you drive through, um, it's very peaceful. Uh-huh. Mm-hmm. Um, it's very historical. I think that's really what sets it apart. It's uh, It was very, very important in the 15th century. And um, with all the important abbeys and monasteries, um, it has a, a bit, but being rural, uh, it's it's just pleasant to, and peaceful to drive through and to visit. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And of course, the wine. I mean, you can't <laughs> separate that from the rest of the history. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. Well, then tell us a little bit about the history. What happened that was outstanding there? Well, um, because of all the rivers that run through Burgundy, um, we are a watershed. That means that all the rivers that run through here flow to a different body of water. Aha. So it's from here. Um, it's what you call in French the partage des eaux. Yes. And so, um, for example, the Yonne and the Seine flow north to the channel, mm-hmm. so to the no- north part of the Atlantic. The Loire, which runs through Burgundy, runs over to, well, um, the uh, Atlantic uh, in the west, mm-hmm. and the Seine, which runs into the Rhone, runs down to the Mediterranean. That's true. It's all over. I hadn't thought of that. It's all over. Yeah. That's right. Well, this is why it was um, inhabited so early, because it was easy for people to move along the river valleys or along the rivers. Mm. And so we have here in Burgundy, in the upper Paleolithic, um, uh, uh, um, um time zone, a time called the Solutrian because the rock of Solutre, which is near Macon, uh, gave rise to or was the first to have a particular kind of flint tool. Mm. And so already very early, um, it was inhabited here in Burgundy. So this is like prehistorical times. Prehistoric, right. that's Groups right. of people exactly. who moved along the river and... That's yeah. right, and settled here and found, of course, the plains the plains of the Seine, which were very fertile, um, the slopes too, uh, which facing east, which is good for um, farming and agriculture. Uh-huh, so uh-huh. that's right. Yeah. And so because of this, it was inhabited very early and and it grew uh, very, very quickly, of course, yeah. because of this. And then um, the Celts moved in, the Celts or the Gauls moved mm-hmm. in and... Um, already very early too and we know already in the iron age that um, they had a lot of um, trade with um, so england wales in england there was the whole um, copper trade Mm -hmm. uh, and also with a greater greece which means southern italy so down because if you follow the zone down to the rhone you can get to marseille yes yes greater greece means southern italy i hadn't heard that Southern Italy, oh. that's right, because they call it, the Greeks colonized Southern Italy, oh. and um, right, and we know that because of the treasure of Vix, um, which was found um, in the north of the Côte d'Or, and it comprised what we call a princely tomb. It was actually a princess uh, with the largest bronze crater vase. Uh, found from that part of the world. And we know it's from um, Greece and from that part of the world because of the decoration on it. So and so how so, do you spell that, Vix? Vix, V-I-X. V-I-X. And right. So what is it? Is it something you can visit? It is. It's in the museum in, in Châtillon now. Mm-hmm. Huh? And you can visit and you can see how the tomb was set up. You can see the uh, crater, the vase, mm. um, which I don't have right on in off my head how tall it is, but it's taller than I mm-hmm. am, uh, and I'm one meter sixty three. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. <laughs> Not very tall, but <laughs> um, and it was found, as I said, with uh, the bones of the princess, a gold torque, and a diadem. So very, very rich uh, find. Mm, wow! And it's unique. That's right. So we already know trade at that time uh, was quite active. Mm. Um, and then the Gauls developed, and the Gauls um, here in Burgundy, the largest tribe, because we have to remember we put the Gauls all in one basket, but they were at la- actually lived in nations or in tribes. They probably had different languages, sure. um, a li- little bit like the Native Americans. We, we say Native Americans, but we have to remember they lived in nations, had some different customs. And the largest um, nation or tribe around here were the Edwins, very important. And very early on, they had... Um, 
cooperation with Rome. The Edwins, how do you spell that? I've never heard of them. E-D-U-E-N-S. Well, I suppose no, because each part of France knows best the tribe, the the Gallic, the Gallic yeah. tribe that is there, right? Yeah, yeah. So here it happens to be the Edwins. Okay, the very okay. Tribe. I'll look them up. Um, that's right. <laughs> um, there were others too. And then um, Julius Caesar, of course, was very ambitious. And he um, was governor in Gaul. And he had it in his mind because he always said he'd rather be number one in Gaul than number two in Rome. Mm. And yes, very ambitious. So he used the fact that the Helvets, so the, the uh, tribe in Switzerland, was moving into Edwin territory. And the Edwins called Julius Caesar to get them out, and he saw this as his opportunity uh, for the conquest of Gaul, mm. which, of course, he wrote in his Gallic Wars. Mm -hmm. And in 52 BC, uh, it was the turning point. It was the final battle between um, the Romans and the Gauls, and Vercingetorix uh, was the allied Gallic leader, and he was defeated here in Burgundy at the site of Alesia. Ah. And now there, you can visit the site, and there's a... a, a Archeolo archaeological park that you can visit to see the last battle. And after that, Gaul was under Roman domination. Man, this is like reading a history book. It, it all took place <laughs> over there, didn't it? It all took place here. Wow, that's, that's right. amazing. Because I've heard about all of these events. Like it's right. taken me back to my childhood. And Well, you, know. uh, you study you study Vercingetorix yeah. not only because it was the final battle, but because Napoleon III... Um, began his great ca archaeological campaign at Alizia. Mm. And if you do visit the site, there's a big statue of uh, Vercingetorix, whose face, of course, is modeled on Napoleon III. So it's very uh, mm. <laughs> historic. <laughs> wow. Well, yeah, this is full of history. Full of history. This is great. Right. This is great. Mm -hmm. Okay. So then we're under Roman domination. Uh, we, we call it the Gallo-Roman period because one of the reasons it worked was that the Romans did not impose um, any, it didn't impose religion on the Gauls. So the Gauls, there's a mixture of Roman religion and Gallic religion here. Um, and we see that in this, the, the funeral uh, steles or the, the funeral markers and things like that. And the gods that they still worshipped, they still worship, for example, Sequana, who is... Um, the goddess of the Seine, because the, the Seine, I forgot to tell you, has its source here in Burgundy. Right. And so, right. And so they worship that goddess here with a lot of ex voto. So we know they were still allowed to worship as they wanted to worship. And what was, and what was, was her name again? Sequana. Sequana. Oh, that's pretty. Sequana. That's right. And that's where Seine comes from over the years, changed many times. But it comes from Sequana, from that word. Oh, wow. Mm hmm. And so the Romans were here and they built a lot of um, their little towns, which in an outpost and camps and things, which in the third century became what we call a castrum. Yes. Um, now, a lot of the towns that we know today in France were castra. And a castrum is literally a walled in Roman town. Uh -huh. And this is in the third century because most of the, Ro during the Roman um, domination, t towns weren't walled in. The Roman Empire was a relatively safe place until this time. And, of course, the Roman army was a great fighting machine. Mm. But in the 3rd century, it was a time of migrations and invasions and barbarians. And so they walled in their towns. Mm. And most of the towns that we know today, and I'll name the ones in Burgundy, Auxerre, Dijon, Beaune, Chalon, Tournu, Macon, all of these towns were former Roman castra that developed into medieval towns and into the towns we know today. Yes, yes, yes. I, I, you know, when I was a kid, I, um, my father, every summer, would take a job in... He was an electrician. And he would take okay. a job in different areas of France um, because he couldn't take five... You know, he couldn't take the whole summer off. Mm -hmm. But he, could, he would take a four or five week job somewhere in France and then some time off with a family. But he brought us with him. Oh, and, that's and nice. And one summer, we all camped in Auxerre. Okay. And mm -hmm. I remember the area as being just beautiful. The, the, yeah. the fields mm -hmm. were lovely. The people were friendly. And I remember they kept rabbits 
uh, <laughs> this is like what a 10 year old remembers, you of know? Of course, that's no, a wonderful childhood memory. <laughs> that everywhere we went, people kept rabbits because growing that's up funny. in the center of Toulouse, I never, I had never seen a rabbit before, <laughs> obviously. <laughs> so the fact that even the school, I, we went to a tiny school and the school had a rabbit hutch. Um, and it was like a project to show, you know, the kids, the reproduction and the babies mm -hmm. growing and all of that stuff. Oh, but I have very fond memories. I, I, I said 10, but I probably wasn't even 10. I probably was like seven or something. So right. that brings back great memories. Yeah, and Auxerre, just to tell you, Auxerre is the major city in um, the Yun, which we talked uh -huh. about before. A very important historic city too. It was um, a castrum and then later the great Saint-Germain. Um, was born there, and he built several churches. So if you do visit Auxerre, there are many. Um, there's the um, the the Église of Saint Germain. There's the Cathedral of Saint Etienne, um, Saint Eusebius. So there are many churches there because he he because of him. And isn't uh, Georges Sand from that area? She's an author from. Uh, isn't she from the Puisay? She might. No, that's no, that's Colette. Oh, Colette. Colette. Was, Colette was brought up in the Puisay, yeah. uh, which is in that area um, on the way down from Paris. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And yes, yeah, Georges Sand, I think she was now. I'm having a doubt about Georges well, Sand, but that's up. Never mind, true. never mind. I, I take you off. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> no, but no, but it's interesting. It's interesting to know who grew up where and what they said about it, of yeah, course. Yeah, huh? yeah, yeah. That's right. Okay, so let's go back to your to your history here. We so then the Romans, of course, now already um, in the second century AD, because we had the Romans and they built Autun, which is also, if you're interested in archaeology, um, there's an archaeological site there and part of the Roman site because Augustus uh, moved the city, the Edwin city of Bibracht, uh, Montbeuvray, to Autun. Mm. And so if you want to visit, um, it has a wonderful medieval cathedral. Uh, I, I've sent you a picture of that. And it's important because the, the sculpture is signed by the artist, which is very rare. Wow. And it also has the Roman part. So Ota is interesting. Um, and in the second century, though, it, because Burgundy once again was an easy place to come to because of the river valleys, the passage east, north, there were a lot of evangelizers who came. So Burgundy was evangelized very early. And I'm telling you this because this is important for its later medieval history where uh, two very, very important um, uh, orders, the Clunisiac order and the Cistercian order, were founded. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So it was, it was evangelized very early. Mm -hmm. uh, that's um, and it's still probably so, to this day uh, more than average religious people. That might, I mean, that might be my just my perception. Your perception, um, you know, I don't know that. Mm. I don't know. I see what I see. I know that they're um, they've closed a lot of churches that are no longer. We have a church here in Dijon Saint Jean, which is now a theater. Mm. Uh, but Dijon was known for a lot of its churches. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, so maybe yeah. there were just too many. I don't know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so just to say, now, Burgundy um, was called Burgundy. Oh, we, well, we had the Merovingian kings and the uh, Carolingian kings. And um, <clears throat> at the time of Clovis, just before the time of Clovis, so the first real, the king of the Franks, uh, a people called the Burgunds came from the north, from the Baltic, uh, they were chased away by the Huns, pretty much, and they settled first in the Savoy, but they were chased away again, and they settled in this area in Geneva, in Lyon, and there they were a very refined people, and their kingdom became known as Burgundia. Mm. And it is from there, these people, the Burgunds, that Burgundy got its name. So Burgundy wasn't Burgundy until the 5th century AD. <laughs> Uh, so that's important to know. And they didn't last very long. They came in the 5th century, and it was in the 6th century that Clovis um, defeated the Burgundian king. But they left the name. And, but they left the name, oh. and they pretty much helped with Christ the Christianity part too, because when Clovis married the Burgundian princess Clotilde, he converted to Christianity. Ah. And of course, what the king does, uh, all the, the people do, the subjects that's do too, it becomes popular. That's true. And so that was another big push here for Christianity. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, right, so then, um, but it didn't become a duchy 
Now, I'd like to explain what the duchy is because I know English people know that. A duchy is literally the place where the duke reigns. Yeah. Kingdom for the king, a county for the count, and the duchy for the duke. Sure. Um, and it became a duchy in the uh, ninth century when a man named Robert the Justicier, I think we say Robert the Justicar in, in English, <laughs> he, it was a... Um, Again, the eighth century was a time, um, the ninth century was a time of confusion and invasions and things. And he managed to unite um, the counties already or the, the, um, the fiefs of Auxerre, Dijon, Chalon, several, put them together. And the king at the time recognized it as a duchy because he managed to keep it peaceful. And that's where really the Duchy of Burgundy began. Mm. Mm. And then... Um, just before the accession of the Capetian dukes, because we have Hugues Capet, who was king of France, and he gave rise to the Capetian dynasty. Exactly, another big, right. yeah. another big dynasty. Yeah. But before they're just all before, there, they're all from there. Well, they're not all from here. Hugues Capet wasn't from here, okay. but because we had a duchy here, and you, you tried to have a lot of children, you had to give your children each son something. Mm. So one became the Dauphin, the heir to the throne, one became the Duke of this, one became the Duke of that, and one became the Duke of Burgundy. I see. So he wasn't from here. But um, before the the accession of the Capetian Duke, so in the line of the uh, king, uh, Capetian kings, uh, we have the foundation of the Monastery of Cluny. I'd like to stop two minutes because Cluny yeah. was a very important um, uh, entity here. Yeah. In 910, or around 910, um, William of Aquitaine left his land that he had here in Burgundy to the apostles Peter and Paul with the idea that the monks would come and create an abbey mm. to pray for him for, the, for eternity. Mm -hmm. And that happened. And um, they brought an abbot uh, from Franche-Comté who knew how to manage abbeys, and they built the first church. Um, called Cluny One. Mm. Huh? Now it wasn't called Cluny One then, <laughs> um, and uh, it grew because they were so good at praying. You tell me, of course, they're good at praying. They're monks, but they were especially good at praying. That they the community grew and grew. Mm -hmm. And remember, at that time, monks weren't from poor families. You often they were from wealthier sure. aristocratic families, and they brought their money. Huh? They gave whatever money they had to the um, abbey. And so they grew so much, they need to build a second church, which they did, um, called Cluny II now. Mm -hmm. That's a very clever name. And they grew again and again until in the 12th century, um, an abbot named Hugues de Semur decided to build they had so much money. Uh, they were also good at singing because it was at this time in the 12th century, they truly developed the liturgical um a song, so the Gregorian chants, mm. and this is really well developed at Cluny. And so in the 12th century, they built an enormous church to go with the rest of the monastery mm. called Cluny III now. Mm. And it was the biggest church in Christendom until the building of St. Peter's in Rome wow. in the 16th century. So just to give you an idea of the power, a lot of the popes came from Cluny at that time. And remember, there's no separation of church and, and state at that time. Oh. And so they had a say in political, uh, diplomatic affairs all over Europe. Mm -hmm. And they founded sister and daughter abbeys all over. So there's the Clunisiac order. Um, technically, they follow the uh, Benedictine rule. Mm -hmm. But we call it the Clunisiac order because of their power to pray and to sing, I suppose. Oh, pray because they prayed for the dead. That's how they made so much money. People would <sighs> give money. For them to pray over their remains for eternity. Some people would come to Cluny to be buried. Some would just give money for the monks to pray uh, mm. forever mm. over their remains. Mm. And so this was very lucrative because, of course, at that time, you needed to search your salvation, right? Sure, sure. Everybody would. Yeah, yeah. That's what people did. And did, That's so right. did. Um, Okay, the Cistercians, the 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 image. No, this is Clunisiac. I haven't talked about the Cistercians oh, sorry. yet. Oh, sorry. Sorry. Okay, Clunisiac. This is the Clunisiac okay, okay. monks. Right. Cistercians came later. later. Okay. Okay. So uh, that's so Cluny. We already have the beginning of Cluny already, and then we the, we have the Capetian kings, and the first um, kings uh, with the Capetian dukes, and the first Capetian because the Capetian dukes there are a lot of Eudes and Roberts and Hughes. Um, so the first one. Um, uh, a Robert, he his one of his 
ambitions was to create a duchy, a uh, peaceful duchy, of course, where um, abbeys, monasteries, and churches could grow. Mm -hmm. He was very involved in this. And that is why under his reign, which lasted um, um, until 1361, he, he and his descendants um, allowed a lot of churches and abbeys to be built here. And it was in uh, 1098 that Robert of Molem, so a monk from uh, an abbey in the north of the Côte d'Or, left his abbey to found uh, a new abbey because he wasn't happy with the way they were applying the Benedictine rule. Mm. Benedictine rule, eight hours of sleep, eight hours of prayer, eight hours of work. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so he wanted to f found an abbey where they adhered to that strictly. And he got some land in a place um, here in the Côte d'Or, not far from Nuit Saint-Georges, a reedy, marshy place. And the old French word for reed is cistel. And from the word cistel, they got the word cito. Ah. Right. And so he founded his abbey there, and it grew. And as I said once again, in the 12th century, it was the great St. Bernard uh, uh -huh. who reformed the abbey. He... Um, made sure he was, it was very austere. Uh, the monk slept in the dormitory, no heat. Uh, they didn't speak during meals, all of those things. They worked hard. Um, and he reformed the abbey in that he founded the Abbey of Clairvaux. He's often called um, Bernard of Clairvaux. Uh -huh. And then once again, they founded sister and daughter abbeys all over Europe. Huh. And the best preserved, now, most of these abbeys were destroyed at the revolution. Mm. The best preserved Cistercian Abbey is in England. And the second best, again, uh, preserved is here in Burgundy, the Abbey of Fontenay. And I talked about metalworking uh, uh, before. Mm -hmm. And uh, there, the monks had a forge. And you can mm. still see the forges, right? And they worked metal mm. there. And so, right, it was important. Um, and it's a beautiful place uh, to visit. Yeah. Are there still monks today? There are no monks today. It's privately owned. Mm. There are no monks today. Now, at Cito, the seat of Cito, which was again destroyed at the revolution, uh, there's a modern church. There are still monks, and the monks still make Cito cheese, which is very, very good. <laughs> it's not as it, it's, it smells strong, but try it if you want, if you like cheese, to buy it and taste it. Because the first time I, it smelled too strong. I don't like cheese that smells mm -hmm. too strong. But when I finally tried it, it's so yummy. Yeah, usually it's it's the case with a lot of smelly cheeses in France. That's right. Not as strong as you That's think. That's right. Yeah. They smell really awful. But then if you go beyond that and you try it, they, they have a very nice flavor, most of them. Mm -hmm. That's right. Yeah. And they make cheese and they make honey and some other goods that you can buy. And the only historic building that remains is a fifth century, 15th century library. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, it's all modern. Mm -hmm. so oh, just okay. to give you an idea. And the same thing at Cluny. The church, the only thing that's left of that enormous church is one arm of the transept, mm. uh, the bell tower. And um, if you visit, you have to use your imagination. But they've done a very good job with the um, 3D reconstruction. Mm. Um, and so... Just to well, it's, oh, it's got to be touch. very pretty because if they, I mean, older buildings, you know, sometimes they're um, they're very worn down. So it's it's got to be very nice since they rebuilt it. Did they rebuilt it to look like the old building. <laughs> Sorry, we lost power there. So um, let me try and resume where we were. We were talking about the Cistercians. Uh -huh. Do you mind going over that again? Sorry. Sure. Cistercians, founded in 1098 by Robert of Molem, um, in a place um, here in the Côte d'Or, uh, with um, called Cito because of the Cistel, um, right. and they became as powerful as Cluny. They founded sister and daughter abbeys all over um, Europe. Yep. And became very important. Yep. They um, in Pontigny, so in the north, they housed um, Thomas Becket when he was exiled by Richard II. Mm. Um, so they became very powerful. Mm -hmm. uh, and again, I said Cito was destroyed. The abbey was destroyed at the revolution, but um, they had a big say in. Um, political and diplomatic affairs in Europe. Now, mm -hmm. while we're talking about the Clunisiac monks and the Cistercian monks, this is a good time to mention wine. Mm. 
because my favorite why? subject. Good, <laughs> well, good. You came to the right place <laughs> because already there were vineyards here um, in Roman times, probably even in Gallic times. Um, the oldest vineyard that's been excavated is in Gevry Chambertin, and um, a Roman vineyard, and they see exactly how. The plants were planted how far apart. It's very interesting. Now, the Romans planted wine near major waterways. Uh, you think about Bordeaux near the Garonne mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. or here in Burgundy near the Saône, the Seine, the Yonne, mm -hmm. because they could transport it easily. And they needed slopes because slopes are the best place in any Any wine growing place you look, most of the time it's on slopes. The best wine are grown on slopes. So yeah. it was ideal here. Mm. And so uh, it was really the greatest extent of vineyards was under the Roman Empire. Um, but little by little, uh, Domitian, for example, had the vines pulled out so there wouldn't be too much competition with uh, Italian wines or mm. Roman wines. But it was really... Under the monks, the hard-working monks, the Cistercians and the Clenusiac monks, that wine, the art of winemaking was perfected. Um, they experimented with which grape grew best in which place and the vinification of wine and all of that. Mm -hmm. And it was really the monks and the dukes of Burgundy, the Valois dukes, who discovered that different uh, grape varieties grew best. Um, and they discovered that it was really the Pinot Noir that grew best uh, in the soils of Burgundy mm -hmm. or the Chardonnay. So already that idea of the single grape variety began in the Middle Ages. Which in France is very unusual. Very unusual, that's The rest right. of France, um, have, pretty much. Bordeaux, well, it's a mixture of various... What we call varietal, varietal wines. Yes, yes. That's right. And um, which is its own challenge because you have to have a consistent wine by mixing the different grape varieties. You have to have a consistent wine every year. Yes. Here in Burgundy, we have a single grape variety um, For all the reds, it's the Pinot Noir, and all the gray, red, uh, whites, it's the Chardonnay. So mm -hmm. you know, you don't have to put it on the label. You know <laughs> that when you're drinking um, a Burgundy wine, uh, it's going to be a red, it's going to be a Pinot Noir, and a white, it's going to be a Chardonnay. There are two exceptions to that. The Aligoté, mm -hmm. uh, which is a regional wine. We can talk about the appellations in just a minute. But it's a regional wine that's grown pretty much anywhere. And um, it will say Aligoté on it. And it can be grown, as I said, in any area, in any part of Burgundy. Burgundy, yeah. And it's, right. it's usually um, enjoyed with oysters. Okay, you can eat it with oysters. That's right, and shellfish. Now, I just like to say they've made a lot of... Um, It's a new you wine to drink young, which means it's yes. sometimes a little acidic. But it is, they've made a lot of progress with it. At the beginning, when I first arrived, drinking a, a aligoté alone was a little scratchy. That's not a don't use that word. It's not a it's not a good word. It's not an official word. But you but know it's what? It's very strict. Exactly. <laughs> That's right. Going down it wasn't very smooth. But they've mm -hmm. made a lot of progress with the vinification, and um, you can have a very pleasant um, aligoté to drink alone, because we often drink it with the black currant liqueur to make a kir. Yes. Right, yes. which is now you find everywhere, but which uh, was uh, developed here in Burgundy by Felix Kir, K-I-R, oh. yes, who was a person. Oh. He was uh, mayor of Dijon in the 60s. In fact, he was a canon. He was a man of the cloth. Mm. And um, he was a canon, and he was truly um, a man of the people. Mm -hmm. He um, wanted to, we have a lot of black currant bushes here, mm -hmm. and he wanted to find a way to promote different Burgundy products. So he invented this drink to mix the black currant liqueur with the aligoté wine to make a kir. Mm -hmm, which and is that, a lovely drink. Yes, it is. He also, just to tell you, because they celebrated the 50th anniversary of the, we have a lac kir, a lake called Lake Kir here in Dijon. And, and he thought, yes, and it's, he full thought of it's full of kir, that's right, so come and <laughs> swim and drink. He fought to get it built because we don't have a wa major waterway here in, in Dijon. It's missing. We don't have a big river. We have a little river. Mm -hmm. And so he thought the Dijonais needed sort of a water plan where they could go and walk and enjoy. Yeah. And um, he pushed this through. Um, just to tell you a little bit about his personality, too. He, um, he was a revolutionary. 
uh, and uh, resistant uh, during the, the World War II. And there was an attempt on his life and he had to leave Dijon for a while uh, because he was trying, he was part of the major part of the resistance. Mm -hmm. So he really, and he lived to be an old man. Uh, he was mayor of Dijon in the 60s. And so he's really a great personality, of course, mm -hmm. not known in the rest of, of France, but um, a great personality here. But he, his name lives on with the Kia. I, I, all, on. Over, all over the world, people have Kia, right? Yeah. I mean, now it's, it's all over the world. That's yeah, right. Yeah. And Kia Royal, Kier Royal. Which, the one which you make with champagne. Right. Well, you're supposed to make it with Cremant de Bourgogne, Burgundy sparkling mm -hmm. wine, but now right, you right, right. champagne. Right. For rich people, it's champagne, and for the rest of us, it's crème on the Bourgogne. Yeah. That's right. <laughs> so, um, so we're get, getting back to wine, of course, I digressed. Um, no, it's my fault. Um, and so the wine, so it was the monks that developed this wine, and the winemaking techniques. And now, today, they still follow the basic uh, same winemaking techniques, a little bit more uh, modern with... Um, machines and things, although a lot of the um, grape picking, the harvesting is done by hand here in Burgundy, mm. uh, still today, and it um, everything's very highly regulated, including the appellation, the appellations on the bottles. So just for you to understand how Burgundy wine works, um, we have four major appellations. The first is a, a regional appellation, which means, so if you have a Burgundy Pinot Noir, the grapes can come from anywhere in the Burgundy region. Mm -hmm. Then you have a, a like Aligoté, it's a, it's a regional appellation. And then you have yep. a village or village appellation. Mm -hmm. So you can have a Bone village or Merceau village. Or, um, and yep. that, the grapes have to come from around that particular village. Yep. And then you have a Premier Cru, yep. where the grapes come from a particular plot of land, which we call a clima. Or the Grand Cru. So it's clima like uh, climate? Well, it's called a clima. It's really a combination of terroir, so soil, climate. It's really a clima is a plot or a parcel of land. Hmm. C-L-I-M-A? T. T. Okay, okay. You like climate, exactly. It's like okay, climate. Okay, okay. It's called a clima. Okay. And this, is very, this notion is very, very important here in Burgundy because this is why the... Uh, why you can have a Pinot Noir wine, for example, a very good example is Pomar and Volnay. Perhaps you know Pomar and Volnay. Sh certainly. Yes. They're right next to each other, the village of Pomar and the village of Volnay. Mm -hmm. And they both grow Pinot Noir wine. They both have the same exposure to the sun. But the Pomar wine is a rich, heavy, musky wine you drink with game. And the Volnay wine is what we call uh, a feminine wine, lighter, fruitier. Mm -hmm. um, and so just to give you an idea, these two vineyards, which are side by side, villages side by side, can produce such different wines. Yeah. This is the idea of the clima, what we call in the clima in Burgundy. Mm -hmm. Wow. Right. Yeah, it's true that Pomar is um, kind of kicks you around. Right. A bit. It's a heavy, <laughs> heavy wine. Huh? For yeah. a Pinot Noir, it's a heavy wine, whereas the Volnay yeah. is a much lighter wine. Same thing. Chambon Musigny, it's a red wine too. Or you look at Morceau and um, uh, um, the, the Morceau, uh, mm -hmm. uh, which are the white wines. Huh? Mm -hmm. um, it has a different flavor from the, the white wines that you get in Gevry Chambertin, for example. Mm -hmm. Those are red wines. Um, or in the and these are all Premier Cru or Village? Um, it can. They have. They have all of them. They have all of them. Okay. Now the village are usually because it's hard to see when you don't see the the um, landscape, but the you have um, the flat part which is just before the sown plains that leads up to the slopes which are called the côte, mm -hmm. and it's usually on the flatter plain part where the village and the regional appellations are grown, and mm -hmm. on the slopes. Um, the bottom of the slopes, the top of the slopes for the premier crew, and in the middle of the slopes for the grand crew, because the drainage and the exposure to the sun is much better. Mm -hmm. So grand crew is the it's best. Top. That's right. Yes. yes. And okay. just to give you some mythic names, we have the Clos de Vougeau, because mm -hmm. a Clos, let's mention that, a Clos is literally an enclosure which encloses a clima or a plot of land. Right. And um, this, that's the biggest Clos. Mm -hmm. And the smallest clo is the Romanée Conti, 
I don't know if mm -hmm. you've ever tasted Romane Conti. I have not, but I've heard of it. Well, because I'll tell you why you haven't. Romane Conti, they, oh, it's the smallest clove. They only produce about 6,000 bottles a year, and they're all sold even before they're produced. Ah. And they can get up to 3,000 euros a bottle. That's probably oh, geez, why yeah. right. you have it. But I did see one on eBay or something for 875, so it's a bargain. Yeah, <laughs> who knows? It might not have been the real thing. Right. But, well, I haven't tasted it either. And um, Yeah. No. yeah. Well, some of these super wines, let me interject a little something uh -huh. in here. More and more in France, you're seeing these um there it's kind of a mix between a bar and a and a wine tasting uh -huh, thing. Okay, yeah. Where they have these um distributors on the wall and you will when you walk in, they give you a card that's for 50 euros and you put your card in the distributor for any wine that you want to taste of. Oh, so you, I don't know. They don't I've, have that in Burgundy. No, well, not that I know of. I've never seen that. I've seen them several places in the South of France. So you walk in, they give you a card. They're all friendly and lovely. And you walk around and you see, so it looks like a vending machine, okay. but it's a fancy looking <laughs> oh. vending machine. It has the bottle on top and you will put your glass in there and it'll dispense just an ounce or so. It's not very much. Um, and it puts it on your card. So it takes off some money uh, from your, so it just says, you know, you've just had a taste that cost two euros. And in this kind of, in these kinds of places, you can often taste super expensive wines because you just get an ounce of it. I mean, the I ounce is going to cost find you. you find Conti. But right. It, it, yeah, the ounce might be fifty bucks or more. Right. <laughs> okay. <this> <laughs> so perhaps, perhaps. You know, but in some of these places, it's oh. it's your chance to taste side by side right. some very inexpensive mm -hmm. wines and some very expensive wines. Okay. Uh, oh, which okay. is why I like it because I'm I'm a, a, a I'm a cheap wine buyer, so right. I, <laughs> I I like to say, well, you see, I enjoyed this one. And, uh -huh. But I didn't enjoy this one 200 times more, even though it's 200 times more money. Okay. You know? <laughs> oh, I've never heard of that. There's yeah. probably a lobby here to keep it away. <laughs> <laughs> That's possible. That's possible. Because the wines in the south of France are usually not near as expensive no. as Burgundy, you no. know? No, no. Yeah. That's right. And I heard of stories where uh, people actually buy one row of... Yes, yes, yes. ...of... of uh, of these uh, vines, Absolutely. I guess you yeah. call them, mm -hmm. um, and and that's a big investment. Yes. You own one row, mm -hmm. like it's a big deal. Um, yep, that's right. It's prestigious. That's exactly right. Because let me just say too, here in Burgundy, we don't have any big estates like in Bordeaux. You have in Bordeaux the huge estates with just hectares and hectares of vineyards. Here, yeah. it's still all small, uh, mostly family-owned um, uh, wineries. Mm -hmm. And they might own a plot of land, let's see, in Jeffrey Champertin, Bone. So they own not just one big estate, but different plots in different areas, sometimes in the same town. And so it just is a completely different wine culture than in Bordeaux, probably in any other part of France. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it, we don't, it's the wine, even though percentage in terms of percent, econ economically, it's a big percentage wine industry. It's a small percentage in terms of actual land. It's only like 2% of the whole agricultural production. But mm. it's a big percent, obviously, because the wines are expensive. Yeah, I should just prices. mention, I didn't mention that we have five major wine growing regions. I've been talking about the Côte de Beaune and the Côte de Nuit because they're legendary. Mm -hmm. But we should mention Chablis. Uh, and maybe yeah. been to Chablis if you were near Auxerre. Um, Chablis is in the north in Lyon. It's the really the northernmost wine growing area. And Chablis is still made with a Chardonnay. It's just named for the town of Chablis. It just became na named for that town, even though they grow wine in other towns around there. Mm -hmm. And then we have the Côte de Beaune and the Côte de Nuit, which are in the Côte d'Or. And then we have the Côte Chalonnaise, which are around the t in the saône loire around the town of chalon sur saône which is the second largest town in Burgundy. Yeah. With names like Ruy, uh, Givry, Mercure. I don't know if you know those wines. Some of them, Givry, yes. Givry, well, uh, I, I'm, I have a little weakness for the Ruy, the white Ruy. Huh? They're not mm. too expensive and they're quite nice. Yeah, how much would you... So, so people around Toulouse... 
um, when they buy a bottle of wine to take to a friend's house for dinner, for instance, mm -hmm. they'll probably spend anywhere between 10 and 30 euros. Okay. In Burgundy, how much would you have to spend to take a bottle well, to a Well, if you house? want to take a really fine wine, but you could probably spend that much between 10 and 30. I think you could get okay. um, a good Rue for 12 euros. Okay, okay. Right? See, so but it's, you're not that different. It's just... Right, there's but, but that's because the, 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 there's not, it's not, as, not yet, not as prestigious as, mm -hmm, as, mm -hmm. the, as a Meursault uh, or a, uh, a Chevrolet Chambertin. Yeah, yeah, right? yeah. The name does it all, really. Right, and, I mean, and the, and the is, wine is probably better, the too. The wine but... is good if you taste a, a nice uh, yeah. Meursault or a, uh, mm -hmm. um, right, um, a Montrachet, for example. Um, <laughs> so... Then we have, and then we have the Côte Maconnaise, which is very toward the south, just before the Beaujolais. And there they grow a lot of white wine and names like the saint véran and the puy Fusé that you might know. Mm -hmm. They're known especially yes. for their whites. They make a few reds. And again, the, the, the quality and the price is there. It's very good. You can get a reasonable bottle. Um, it's really... So when you, when you do some guiding work, do mm -hmm. you take people, do you do... You do Uh, like wine tours or we do wine tours sometimes it's already imposed where we're going to do the wine tasting sometimes we choose the wine places we're going to do the wine tasting i try and choose the smaller um winemakers mm -hmm. because um you get more personal uh, attention yeah. um and they tend to open better bottles i think uh they're personal they can talk about their personal wine when you go to the bigger winemakers they are what we call Negociant, that means they buy wine. They don't make their wine. They buy it from the winemakers and then they mm -hmm. sell it and market it. <clears throat> right, right. So they're marketers. They're marketers. That doesn't mean yeah. they don't know about it. It's oh, just, sure. It's so nice to hear a winemaker talk about his own wine and his or her own wine and the own experience. <laughs> and do a lot of these uh, smaller winemakers, do, do you find some that speak English pretty well? I mean, some of them do speak English. It's always good to call ahead of time. You can, of mm -hmm. course get <clears throat> on the, what's called the Rue des Grands Crus. It's the wine road. And mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. just stop in and see. But most of them do speak English. Yeah, yeah. <coughs> Or have someone who speaks English. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, but I'm thinking if somebody wants to hire you to be taken around to these wine places. Okay, we took a quick break for, uh, for a glass of water. We're back. Okay. I have to finish the history. Of course, I had many side... I was been sidetracked, but... It's just so interesting. <laughs> yes. Um, <laughs> I need to finish the history with the Valois Dukes. Uh, yeah. They came to power in 1361 when John II was king of France of the Valois Capetian line. And he had four sons. And of course, as I said before, you have to give each of your sons something. First became yeah. the Duke, the Dauphin. Second, yep. the Duke of Berry, the Duke of Orléans. And the last one, whose name was Philippe le Hardy, Philip the Bold, became Duke of Burgundy. Mm. And... Um, He, one of the first things he did was marry Margaret of Flanders, and he extended uh, the Duchy of Burgundy all the way up to northern France and into modern-day Flanders, all the way up to Bruges. Mm. And so with one marriage, That's pretty big. it's very big. And he worked very hard to increase his power, mm -hmm. which he did, uh, and his descendants did too. Now, it was um, his nephew, Charles VI, who went mad. Remember, the fo La Folie of Charles VI. Yes. And it was really the Duke of Orléans, so the king's brother and his uncle, Philip the Bold, who were running the kingdom of France. Mm -hmm. And the descendant of Philip the Bold, John the Fearless, had this little idea, hey, I know how to do this job. And he um, <clears throat> was very ambitious. And because the English were already here uh, taking over territory you know, during the Hundred Years' War, he was very buddy-buddy with the English, and he had the Duke of Orléans killed mm -hmm. so that there was no rivalry. And then, of course, the people of the Duke of Orléans had him killed. This is all within the um, Hundred Years' War. And then mm -hmm. the third Duke of Burgundy, Philip the Good, um, it was under his rule, he reigned the longest, that the Burgundians sold Joan of Arc to the English and okay. ended the Hundred Years' War. Okay. Mm -hmm. Wow. And it was then the last duke, Charles the Bold, uh, still had this ambition to create the kingdom of Burgundy, and he was killed in Nancy in 1477. Mm. But it was under these dukes that Burgundy was really at its apogee. It 
was a center of art, of music, of culture. The Dukes of Burgundy were important all over Europe. They had an yeah. enormous duchy uh, with a lot of power. And so they really, if you come here, you'll see a lot about the Dukes of Burgundy. They're called the Great Dukes of the West. Mm. And so, right, a lot of the building uh, uh, and things under these dukes. A lot of names that we recognize, obviously. And names that you should recognize, that's right. Yeah, 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 yeah. Mm -hmm. Wow. It's, it sounds like a fabulous area. It's so strange that not more people go visit it, right? Well, I think people, I guess so. I think people come to France either for Paris or for the sun and the sea. Huh? Yeah. They think of Provence. Yeah. Yeah. But a lot of people yeah. think of Burgundy because we don't have fantastic weather. We have sort of gray, rainy weather and um, we have no beach. We have lakes and things and pools. We have no beach. We're far from yeah, the sea. Yeah. So yeah. people don't think of it. Wine lovers come, of course. and especially That's true. That's like true. Beach. Well, but I, uh, you asked me uh, in pre -pre preparation for this uh, show, you sent me some pictures. It really looks beautiful. And it looks like there's plenty of activities for kids, mm -hmm. yes. um, for people who love gastronomy and wine. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's just, it's like a overlooked area, I guess. Mm -hmm. It's it's you up know? and coming, but it is. Because we are, yeah. apart from the wine, we have our, uh, it's a gastronomic region. Um, snails come from here, the Yes. Burgundy snails, the beef burgundy, beef burgundy, coq au vin. We have the gougère, you know gougère? No, I don't. What is that? A little uh, pâte à choux with cheese. It's uh, you serve it with an uh, oh. your aperitif. Very good. The, uh, oh. Les omelettes. You know that? No. Poached eggs and red wine sauce. Those. It's very typically Burgundian. Uh, I have Jean, never Jean had Jean that. Persillé, the parsley ham. Yes, 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 that I that's know. That's from here too. So we're also a gastronomic region. That's. Uh -huh. Very good. Yeah, you know, and that's what. That's a sign that there's a lot of history there, you know. Uh, the areas that have a lot of history also have a lot of wine and a lot of gastronomy. Mm -hmm. It just goes all together. together. Like, right. uh -huh. you know, this stuff has been developed over centuries. Mm -hmm. So it's it's just a fabulous... Um, I don't know. I it's one it's an area of France that I haven't really been to since I was a kid, like I mentioned, and I really want to go back and see it. Is there a time of year where you're less likely to have rain and gray? Um I particularly fond of April in Burgundy because all of the fields of the rapeseed are in bloom. These big fields of yellow. Yellow, yeah. And it looks beautiful. And mm -hmm. it could rain though. Uh it could rain. Yeah. It could rain at any time here. We have a very continental climate. <laughs> <laughs> have your have your you know I always walk around with my yellow um rain it's jacket. It's a good idea. It's just a good <laughs> idea, that's right. Me too. I always have my umbrella with me. And it's probably not super cold. It's not it's not super cold, no. Yeah, yeah. That's right. So, so you have to tell us how people can get a hold of you because you're fascinating and really <laughs> your historical knowledge is like really wide. Like you love this stuff, don't you? I do. I do. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. That's great. Um, well, so how can people get a hold um, of you? I don't have a, a website, but um, I'm available by um, Gmail. So Kelly Camborian mm -hmm. um, at gmail.com. People can you better there. you better spell Camborian because it's with a K. It's with a K. So it's Kelly K E L L Y K A M right away Camborian K A M B O R I A N. Okay, and I'll put that on the web. Okay. You know, I'll put a link to that uh -huh. on the website. Um, and I'm on Facebook. You can find me on Facebook. I do. I am on Twitter and on LinkedIn. So any of those places, uh, people can find me. And you're you're Kelly Camborian on uh, Twitter as well. I'm Kelly Camborian on Twitter on all of those places. That's right. Okay. Mm -hmm. Well, you ha so you haven't found any crazy names for yourself. <laughs> no, no. But you know, I, I think when I started guiding, it was um, I didn't really think I'd develop it into a business. Um, mm -hmm. I just did it because I enjoyed it, and so I never really thought about. I mean, I could. It's not too late. But I never really thought about creating a company. Um, mm -hmm. But yes, why not? It could happen. Why not? Why not? So, like, um, do you, in your work, do you typically uh, meet people somewhere and give them a tour? Is that how it works? Or do you pick them up in a car? Or? I could do that. I could pick them up in a car. Often, sometimes they have their own car um, and they prefer to drive. And then we go to a particular place or I meet them at the monument. I mm -hmm, meet people mm -hmm. um, often in Bone, for example, um, mm -hmm. or here in Dijon at the hotel or, yes, either way. 
Yeah, yeah, because I mean, this is an area where you really need a car if you want to get around. You need a right? car, and that's that's right, especially if you want to do the wine route. Um, yeah, and if you want to yeah. go from, you could, I mean, you could just stay in the city of Bone or around Bone, and and they could take you from there. Um, yeah. But. Yeah, it's nice to have a car because really driving through the countryside. For example, Cluny, if you want to go to Cluny, you need a car. There's no train. Mm -hmm. If mm -hmm. you want to go to the Abbey of Fontenay, you need a car. If you want to go see the Vase de Vix, uh, the big, you, ha you need a car. So those things, mm -hmm. yes. Mm -hmm. And what's the most scenic, like a, a, a very scenic town where you could s stay for a few days and kind of go around to various places? A bone is very nice. Um, bone. bone is very nice. C B O H B E A U N E bone. B E A U N E. Oh, okay, bone. okay. I wasn't thinking of that at all. Okay, yep. I was misspelling it in my mm -hmm. head. Very good. So, and that's pretty central. It's pretty central. You can get to places from there. That's right. Uh -huh. And there's a okay. train station too. So. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now I have to ask you: How did you end up in France? Love, love. <laughs> Oh, bien sûr, bien sûr. Yes. <laughs> You're married to a Frenchman. Oh, he's Belgian, actually. He's Belgian. Yes. Well, that's okay. Yes, yes, mm -hmm. yes. Very good, very good. Excellent. Well, Kelly, it has been lovely talking to you. Thank you so much. And uh, for this episode, Kelly prepared a ton of historical background and things that she sent me uh, via email. And I'm going to use it all up and put it on the website. So there's going to be extensive like historical background. You'll see all the names of the places. Uh, do, do go to the website to find that because that's uh, really good. And since you're the first one to tell us about Burgundy, um, I bet it's going to be a pretty popular episode. Oh, well, I'm, gla I'm glad. I'm happy. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you so well, much. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. And uh, who knows? I might have to have you on again okay. to talk some more about uh, about okay. Burgundy because that's just a fabulous right. place. Very good. Uh, with pleasure. Okay. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. Au revoir. Bye. Au revoir. This brings us to the end of another episode of the Join Us in France Travel Podcast. You can find us at joinusinfrance.com. We love to hear from listeners. Don't be shy. If you're a tour guide or travel professional in France and would like to appear on the show, write to Annie at joinusinfrance.com. And if you love this show, please support it. Go to joinusinfrance.com forward slash support for details. Thank you. Au revoir.